This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Hecna, now live on Kickstarter. From the brilliant publisher behind Humblewood and the Deck of Many, Hecna is a whimsical, dark carnival setting for 5th edition. It presents a full campaign for characters level 1 through 10, filled with dark fantasy and fun, campy escapades. Hecna features incredible artwork depicting charmingly macabre monsters and delightfully twisted adventures from some of the top creators in the RPG world. You can even experience the world of the Revalia today by downloading the latest version of Hecna for free at the Deck of Many website. Then follow the links in the description below to visit their campaign on Kickstarter. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we're taking a look at our top picks for magic items for sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. We've grouped these classes together because as the primary arcane spellcasters in the game of D&D 5e, many of them are interested in many of the same magical items to augment their powerful arcane might. When looking at the magic items for these classes, we tried to pick magic items that we would be excited to receive as a player, but that would be appropriate to hand out as a dungeon master. We've chosen a magic item each from uncommon, rare, very rare, and legendary. And up on the screen right now, you're going to see some of the additional criteria that we looked at when picking these magic items. From a Dungeon Master's perspective, we expect to award an uncommon magic item between level 1 and 4, a rare magic item between level 5 and 10, a very rare magic item between 11 and 16th level, and a legendary magic item gets awarded after 17th level. So we use that approximation to gauge out when a character would approximately receive these magic items as we pick them. We've also picked a wild card magic item that can fit into any of the rarities, and we've focused mostly on the ones presented in the Dungeon Master's Guide. There's a lot to look at today, so let's get rolling. So to start off, let's talk about our uncommon choices. My choice was the Pearl of Power. This magic item lets you use an action on your turn to restore a spell slot of third level or lower. It can be a really powerful item for a spellcaster, especially ones who tend to burn through their spell slots quickly. It's a small, convenient magic item that just gives a spellcaster a little bit more oomph into their abilities. For my uncommon level pick, I really like the Pearl of Power, but I also want to mention that there is a great uncommon warlock specific magic item available at these levels, which is the Rod of the Pact Keeper. This magic item is actually also available in rare or very rare forms because it gives the warlock a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls as well as increasing their saving throw DC for their warlock spells. Plus one for the uncommon version, plus two for the rare, and plus three for the very rare version. I prefer giving this out at the uncommon level because I actually think that giving a plus three bonus to the Warlock spell saving throw DC is extraordinarily powerful <laughs> and really effective. So I do like to give this out as an uncommon item because the other rider power of it is particularly useful for Warlocks, allowing them to, as an action once per day, regain one of their Warlock spell slots. You could give out the Wand of the War Mage if you don't have a Warlock in your party as a close equivalent, but I think I would probably go with the Pearl of Power if I didn't have a Warlock in my party. I think a Warlock with a Pearl of Power and a Rod of the Pat Keeper just gets a little bit more punch into their spell casting, especially with their limited spell slots. Being able to regain one of those is just going to be very beneficial, especially for newer players who might find the limited spell slots of the Warlock restricting. The thing is, is that casting spells is fun, particularly when you get to cast a really awesome spell over and over again. And what spell is more awesome to cast over and over again and make you feel like a powerful arcane spellcaster than Fireball? Which is why the rare Wand of Fireballs is my favorite pick to give out as treasure to a sorcerer, warlock, and wizard for those rare levels. Throwing around fireballs makes players feel powerful. And having a wand with it on demand on a stick to be able to cast it many, many times per day really does make a spellcaster feel awesome. It also lets them use their other spell slots on the more valuable spells that create control effects or interesting utility effects. So even though the Wand of Fireballs is a pretty simple and straightforward magic item, I've always noticed that players that tend to get it 
always start thinking a little bit more critically about what their other spells are because they're like, I don't need to prepare the damage dealing spells anymore. I got the Wand of Fireballs. Speaking of creative spell casting, my choice for a rare magic item is going to be the Ring of Spell Storing. The reason why I love this item so much is it both solves a problem, but also creates a more unique play style for your spellcasters. The problem it solves, again, is that no spellcaster likes to run out of spell slots. And being able to store a few extras of your favorite spell in the ring just means that you can use them in clutch situations to great effect without burning through a spell slot. The thing that I also love about this that creates a, a more creative playstyle is that you need to have a little bit of foresight to use the Ring of Spell Storing. If you can anticipate what sort of problems might be coming in the battle ahead, it actually becomes this really interesting dynamic at the table of what should I put in my Ring of Spell Storing before we head on this adventure? And by choosing the right crafty spells that you're going to require, you get to save your spell slots and hope and bank on those spells coming up so that they can be useful in the right moment. Or of course, you can just store a bunch of your great damage dealing spells in there and just have extra spell slots to use them. The other great thing about the Ring of Spell Storing is if you find a spellcaster NPC in the world that has a different spell list or somebody in the party has a different spell list than you, they can actually put spells that you don't normally have in the Ring of Spell Storing, allowing you a more diverse range of spells. If you want to get really tricky with this as a Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard, you might take that Ring of Spell Storing and say, this is very nice, but give it to your friendly Fighter, Barbarian, or Rogue, and put your spells in the Ring and give that to the, the Fighter or the Rogue, who now can cast those spells, particularly those super tricky concentration-based spells that you'd like to have more than one in effect of. No one's going to anticipate the fighter dropping a wall of force, but now the fighter can put out that wall of force while you put out the wall of fire in the other direction. As we head into the very rare magic items, once you've awarded a spellcaster things like the Wand of Fireballs or the Ring of Spell Storing, I think that they've got a lot of extra gas in their tank to make sure that they don't run out of spells too quickly. And this is where I would start looking at ones that would actually enhance their capabilities in ways that they might not have expected before. And for this reason, I'm really interested in giving my players the opportunity to have a crystal ball of their very own. And just to see how creative they can get once they have the ability to spy on their enemies. Normally I like giving out the crystal ball to my big bad evil guy as a magical item, but I find that a lot of players ignore the value and utility of spells like scrying. And putting a crystal ball in front of the players is an invitation to say, hey, you've become a high level character. It's time to start thinking like a high level character. This magic item is gonna give you access to information that you would never have thought possible before. And because I really like to encourage my high level players to use their divination magic and to use their ritual spells and to start planning things out more carefully, I like to award a crystal ball as treasure to prompt them to do this. I for one think that you can never have enough spells as a spellcaster and the more spells that you have tucked away in a magic item, the better you feel and the more potential you have to feel like that dominating presence on the battlefield. And I'm a big fan of power in the hands of a spellcaster, and there's nothing better in my opinion than the Staff of Power, which is a very rare magic item that I think every spellcaster in the game would be super excited to receive. The first thing about the Staff of Power is when you are attuned to it, you're going to gain plus two to your AC, as well as your spell attack rolls and your saving throws. But keep in mind, this does not add anything to your spell save DC. On top of that, you're going to gain a number of really great spells. The Staff has 20 charges and allows you to cast things like Cone of Cold, Fireball, Globe of Invulnerability, Hold Monster, Levitate, Lightning Bolt, Magic Missile, Rave Enfeeblement, or Wall of Force. Lastly, you have the Retributive Strike, which allows you to smash the Staff over your knee or against the wall or anywhere you want, and it does a wave of damage, which is amplified the, by the amount of charges left in the Staff when you do this. 
I think that the Staff of Power offers so many great things to a spellcaster. Not only is it going to up your AC, which is very important for a lot of those squishy mages out there, and increase the potency of your spells, it gives you a great list of spells, some utility, some damage dealing. But then also, if push comes to shove and you're out of options, you can smash the staff ending a combat encounter. It might also end you as well, or you might teleport to a random plane of existence, but it might be the final trump card to end the BBEG in the campaign, and what a way to go. One thing to note is that if you are a sorcerer or warlock, you can get spells like Wall of Force that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get on your normal spell list. Well, Kelly, the Staff of Power is indeed an impressive magic item and certainly a wonderful magic item to award for a high-level sorcerer, warlock, or wizard. But for those sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards approaching the apex of power, I think that they are going to want to dispense with that staff and take up the Staff of the Magi. The Staff of the Magi is a legendary magical staff that in almost every respect is an upgrade over the Staff of Power. For this reason, I think I would only award one or the other in a campaign. I think a player's either gonna find one or the other, and it's gonna depend on you as a DM how much power you actually wanna place in their hands. Because the Staff of the Magi is a big upgrade. In addition to having 50 charges and a much larger list of spells, it lets the Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard drop Fireballs and lightning bolts cast as if they were cast with a 7th level spell slot. In addition to having other amazing spells on there like Wall of Fire, Conjure Elemental, and Plane Shift. In addition to giving some spells that can be cast at will entirely. The Staff of the Magi also has this unique ability that rather than granting a bonus to your saving throws, you actually have magic resistance gaining advantage on all saving throws against spells. And you gain a special ability that allows you to absorb the energy of a spell that targets you as a reaction and use that to recharge the Staff of the Magi. It's just that the Staff of the Magi also makes retributive strikes, and if you overcharge it, it blows up. And it does a lot more damage than the Staff of Power when it blows up. So just make sure that if you do have a Staff of Power, you never get mind-controlled. I think the Staff of the Magi is the perfect piece of treasure to award to a very accomplished Archmage of some kind. And I might even have that be the apex of a player's epic quest, something that really makes them feel rewarded and like they've earned it. I think that so many players that play Sorcerers, Warlocks, and Wizards dream of acquiring this very powerful item. I would not give it to a player character probably before 18th or 19th level. Um, and at, surely at the end of a great and epic quest. But man, is a player going to feel awesome when they have this thing in their hands. You know, if they go all the way to acquiring the Staff of the Magi, they're going to need to look as awesome as they feel holding that staff. And so I think that to pair with that, they should try to acquire the robes of the Archmage. Now, giving a player character both of these items might be a little ridiculous, but I do think that this is the outfit of the greatest Archmage of all time, is having both of these items. When you attune to the robes of the Archmage, your armor class, as long as you're not wearing any armor, becomes 15 plus your dexterity modifier, immediately bolstering your resilience in combat and taking care of one of the flaws of most spellcasters, which is being relatively squishy. You have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. So like the Staff of the Magi, you are gaining this benefit so that other spellcasters are going to have a hard time hitting you. And your spell save DC and spell attack bonus increase by two, which again is just going to bolster the power. It, this is actually something that I could see pairing with something like the lower end items, even a Rod of the Pack Keeper or a Staff of Power. Again, you're going to make the Spellcaster really, really powerful at that point. Yeah, if you have a Warlock with the Robe of the Archmage, a Rod of the Pack Keeper, and a Staff of Power or a Staff of the Archmage, they could be getting anywhere from plus five to plus seven to their attack rolls with Eldritch Blast on top of their basic abilities and increasing their spell saving throw DC by anywhere from three to five. So 
I do think that it is really important as a dungeon master to be aware of just how much stacking these magic items can really dial up the power of your spellcasting player characters, which is why you want to choose carefully which ones you want to award. Because if you give all of them, you are going to end up with an arcane demigod. Keep in mind that you probably just want to give them one of each rarity, not both legendary items in this case. Although the imagery is cool of the robes of the Archmage and the staff of the Magi together, but I would give that to maybe a prominent NPC or something like that, who mm -hmm. then bestows one of those items upon a yeah. player or something like that. Having run high level D&D games with sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards that have had both items, they are very powerful and they are difficult to challenge, but it's not impossible. So you just want to weigh the immense satisfaction that a player will get from having both of these items with how much extra work you want to do as a DM having to balance your combat encounters. If you have a campaign going up to 20th level, I could see them getting one of them at level 17 or 18. And then when they reach level 20 and are about to go fight the final boss of the campaign that is some sort of god, they get the second item just for that final run to the BBEG. And they get to use all of their power in that final moment. So while these items are super powerful, what did we do for our wildcard picks for some fun and interesting items to give to our spellcasters? When I looked at my wildcard selection, I went back to the rare options because I think that earlier in a campaign, one of the biggest weaknesses of spellcasters is going to be their AC. And so I picked the Bracers of Defense. The reason why I picked this is I've played several spellcasters and I always find myself, even with the shield spell, struggling to match the output that a lot of enemies are hitting me at. I always have a low AC and I'm always striving to up that just a little bit more. The problem is that you can't carry a shield or wear armor in most of these cases. There are some exceptions with the warlock, depending on the way that you go with that. but. Upping the AC of a spellcaster is just a little treat that will always satisfy the players. The Bracers of Defense allow them to keep their hands free for all of their spellcasting, but allow them to up their AC by two, meaning that they're just a little bit more powerful and maybe that shield spell is going to matter a little bit more and they can stand up to some of the tougher enemies out there. They only have to stand up to those tough enemies if they can get up to you. And I think that a lot of arcane spellcasters are going to be interested in some kind of magic item that gives them the power of flight. If you're packing a staff of power or bracers of defense or a wand of fireballs and a ring of spell storing, well, you can very quickly use up all your attunement slots. Enter the Carpet of Flying, a very rare magic item that is a great way for your spellcaster to cruise through the skies in style. Bonus points if you make it an intelligent magic item and draw inspiration from the carpet of the Aladdin films. I think that this is a fun way to introduce some cool utility, a much needed defensive attribute, uh, but also one that creates some interesting problems because the spellcaster might always risk getting knocked off their flying carpet, so they might want to bring Featherfall around with themselves in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it lets them both have that power of flight and not feel like they're using up all their attunement slots. Flight is, again, something that I give out very conservatively to player characters. I usually don't give out a magic item that bestows flight until somewhere after 8th to 15th level or higher, uh, because it really is a very powerful attribute, and they do have spells to do it earlier if, if they want to. Um, but the carpet of flying just is, is so much fun, and I am always reminded of all those great scenes from our own campaigns where your wizard was scooting around on the magic carpet and doing all sorts of aerial tricks riding along with it. It's a fun way to fly that's way more interesting than just giving someone the winged boots. It is possible that in your campaign you may have some spellcasters that are a little bit more oriented towards melee combat, in which case you might want to look at some of the great magical weapons that are presented there. Maybe you have a Hexblade Warlock or a Bladesinger Wizard, in which case try to pick one of the cool elemental weapons, something like maybe Flame Tongue, Frostbrand, or the Nine Live Stealer. Adding in a piece of magical armor or a really cool, flavorful, magical weapon can also round out the toolkit for these spellcasters. So this has been a look at our top magic items for sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. Tell us about some of the favorite magic items you've acquired as a spellcaster in the comments below.
The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. Thank you all so much out there on Patreon for contributing to our work. If you enjoy what we create here on YouTube, please consider checking us out on Patreon as well by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all the previous episodes of that campaign right up over here. And if you're looking for something less on the powerful side, but more on the quirky and creative side, we've got some cool videos talking about cool magic items in D&D right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.